Broadcasting live from Baltimore, Maryland, the Breath of Life Ministries presents Experience the Power. When God gets ready, He can deliver you. If you call on Him, if you trust in Him, be worthy of the praise. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You're supposed to be down flat on your face, but the power of God will lift you up. And now let's go live to the Miracle Temple Worship Center, where our service is in progress. Turn with me now, if you will, to the book of 2 Peter. And tonight, our title is Never Again. It's 2 Peter. And uh, let's go to chapter 3. And uh, let's see. I think I need at least, uh, I need 9, 10, I need 11. <laughs> I may need 12. Good text. Have you found it? Here's what the Bible says, starting with verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Let's bow together as we pray. Father in heaven, tonight we call upon thee once again. I have to stand here and, and sometimes think on a single thought that I may be the one standing in the spot, but I'm not the one who has the pressure. Because the pressure is not on me, the power comes from God. And Father, I simply ask that you'll use me like a little boy's lunch that you'll take what little I bring and multiply it until everybody has enough and there are baskets full left over. I trust you to do it tonight and therefore I am confident not in myself but in your power. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, we're going tonight to uh, one of those subjects that I have heard preached in a way that was a little frightening. But have you noticed already that if it's about Jesus, it can't be frightening? In fact, I'm going to begin tonight with a very different kind of power experience from Jesus. I want to show you the power of Jesus' care for us. Because in fact, he is sensitive to us. He has pity on us. It's not the pity like someone who's ten miles away Jesus is up close and feels what we feel so he has evaluations to make as we come to the end of time the first text I read says that we are about to see something that happens at the end of time the Bible says that the earth is about to be destroyed remember the other night we were talking about the experience of Noah and how water flooded the earth and in that same exchange, you remember the words, not water, but fire next time. The fact is that the wickedness that we are seeing today will not be allowed by our loving Savior to continue. It's got to come to an end. What do you think? Now, you know, people are kind of queasy about that because they say, well, you know, if God is, is mean and if he's always watching to see when I go wrong, he's liable to catch me when I'm wrong. But this text says God is not slack concerning his promises. I want to evaluate that pretty carefully. In other words, he says, I'm coming back again. And I know folk who are frightened that Jesus is coming back. Frightened because they don't think they'll be ready. And I got some news for you. If you try to get ready on your own, you won't be ready. 
We can't change ourselves. I demonstrated very early in this meeting about what most people do with a diet. You remember that? Most people start on a diet. They get one of these things in the mail or they see something on late night television while they're snacking on their couch. And it says you can lose weight this magical way. But then in a few days you're, you're, you're out of that and perhaps into something else. We don't have the willpower to change ourselves. But the fact is that we know somebody who can. So you must begin to look at the Bible through the love of Jesus. And tonight I want you to see the power in his love. In fact, that very verse that we began with, it's chapter 3 and verse 9. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering. Now that's important to understand. Just stop right there. I promised you I was coming back. And I am not going to break my promise, but I'm long-suffering. Now let me tell you what I see there. Jesus says, I promised I'm coming back. I promised I'm going to set it straight. But I want you to be in and not out. So I am thinking about saving you just as surely as I'm thinking about ending sin. When sin is wiped out, I want you to be saved. So instead of being quick to come back, I want to warn you that I will come like a thief in the night. But I'm telling you this so that you are not caught off guard. In other words, let me give you the cut to the chase proclamation. Jesus could catch any one of us doing wrong at any time. Am I right or wrong? If we're not doing it, we're probably thinking about it. I often ask people, what would you do if you could be invisible for a day? Go ahead, think about it, take a chance. Isn't there somebody who you'd like to just, just hit one time? Maybe not, you wouldn't want to kill them. You might not even want to hurt them real bad. Just knock the wind out of them one time. And if you were invisible, you could walk where they are, wait until they are just very vulnerable, and punch them as hard as you could, and nobody would ever catch you because you're invisible. Have I started your mind in the wrong direction? If you think what you would do if you were invisible, then you have got an index to the way you think. You have discovered that the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. If Jesus were trying to catch us wrong, he could do it just about any time. But he says, I'm not willing that anybody should perish. In fact, I want everybody to have the time to get right. Do you see it there? You can't speed read it. You gotta, you gotta take every word and kind of digest it. But what the Lord is saying is, I don't plan to catch people wrong. I'm on your side. I'm not breaking my promise that I'll come back. I'm just long suffering. I can wait until my spirit has had time to move in your life, to make changes in your life so as much as possible you must know that Jesus wants to leave the door open as long as he can so that you can come in if you see it can I hear you say amen now there's another text that I want to show you that is on the other side of that it's Matthew chapter 24 Matthew chapter 24 and I think you'll see a different kind of power in Jesus I have basically been talking about the kind of power that operates to move in and save or to spare but look at what he does to evaluate how he can save the first text says I'm not breaking my promise I'm just long-suffering and I don't want you to perish I want you to come to repentance Matthew chapter 24 and start with verse 21 and here's what it says here if I can get on that right page for then shall the great tribulation such as was for then shall be great tribulation such as not since the beginning of the world to this time 
no nor ever shall be and except those days should be shortened there should be no flesh saved but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened now I could twist this text and make it wrong and tell you that what God is doing is he knows that you might break faith so he's gonna shorten the time that's not what the text is saying what it's saying is that if Jesus does not come soon man's inhumanity to man will take all flesh off the earth now if we never knew that before particularly in the Western world and in America we knew it on September 11 2001 you can talk about what motivated people but what we saw was a horrible demonstration of what people can do to other people and there were thousands who lost their lives in one horrific event right. now if the power of God did not intervene if those angels did not hold the winds on the four corners of the earth those kinds of things would happen practically all the time right. in fact there are some places where life is not as calm as it is in others there are people who've been going through their own 9-11s for a long time in America people have perhaps been more blessed than we deserve the fact is that there are some folk who live every day with trauma but the Lord says if I don't come in and intervene if I don't come back soon then the inhumanity that man has towards his fellow man would destroy all life on the earth and I can tell you that's not going to happen in fact we will read a text in a moment that will affirm that when Jesus comes somebody is going to be alive I, I, I don't want to pick a, a battle with anybody but I hear people from time to time at funerals saying everybody has got to die I agree that most people may see death but we'll read it in a minute when Jesus comes there will be somebody who's alive so the Lord says here's how I evaluate it and this is an important thing for us to understand Jesus is so powerful yet so caring that he says look I keep my promises but I'm long-suffering I have so much mercy towards you that I'm gonna try as long as I can to leave the door open for you to make it in so I'm not slack concerning my promises I just want to let you know that that when my coming occurs you're not gonna get a long time announcement announcement can you imagine what it would be like if I could tell you tonight exactly when Jesus was coming do you know what some people would do I say okay so that means I can do just about anything I want to do until four years from now or two months from now or one week from now and I know exactly when he's coming so what I'm gonna do is like about an hour before he comes I'm gonna get very good I'm gonna be very nice and that means I'll go to heaven well I'm not sure this is watertight reasoning but if people could get right just before Jesus came some people would go there who don't belong there well. <laughs> I don't know about you but if I make it to heaven I don't want trouble to pop up again <laughs> huh? can you imagine being in heaven oh, I made it I've told people over and over again that when I get to heaven you're gonna know me I'm gonna be the guy running I'm just gonna be so happy I, I won't be able to speak to you for a while if maybe a couple of years of just running ah just excited glad to be there I may slow down in four or five years and try to speak to somebody some of you think you're going to heaven you are so sure you're going to heaven that you won't be surprised so I guess you'll be just sitting around all calm and say yeah I'm here I'm not that sure I'm excited about it I want to be there but when I get there I'm just going for a while just be very excited so you just have to forgive me I'll tell you that right now if you see somebody running it'll probably be me but the fact is suppose you would get there and everything is fine and then somebody said did you hear what there's trouble already 
<laughs> Let me tell you something. I don't want any of that. What do you say? When I get to heaven, I want it all smooth. And I believe that that's the way heaven is going to be. What do you say? So, so the Bible says that Jesus is evaluating something. He's giving us enough time. But times are going to get so rough on this earth. And can you see it coming? And folk, I'm, I'm talking way past partisan politics. I'm talking now about the, the public discourse and how it has changed. Have you noticed that people are mean now? Huh? You know, I, I know I've finally reached the age of majority, but I can remember the time when you could walk down a street with no fear and you spoke to people whether you knew them or not. I remember when you could let your children go to the public restrooms by themselves. These days, you certainly won't let your daughter. If you're smart, you won't let your son. And in some places, you had better not go alone yourself. Huh? It's changing. Have you noticed how people drive now? Uh, you got these big cars like mine who take over the road, you know. I mean, then you got these little tiny ones that think they can squeeze through every hole and everything. <laughs> and everybody's blowing their horn like they're talking in another language. There's a different kind of atmosphere. I remember when, when there was a certain kind of courtesy, no matter whether you knew people or not. Uh, the other day I made the mistake of holding a door open for a lady. You should have heard what she said to me. She said some terrible things, as though I had done some disservice. Courtesy is disappearing. And don't sit here just because you claim to be a Christian and think you don't understand it. Because even in the church, <laughs> meetings have changed. You go to a meeting now, there may be some group that came organized to cause bedlam in God's house. There are some things that ought not be there, but it's changing. And if this trend continues every time you look at a newspaper or you look at a news magazine or a news report on television or even on radio there's something else that's happened that makes you wonder what's going on All right. and these wars that are popping up now and these nuclear weapons that are in hands that are nervous All right. there are fingers that tremble over buttons that can wreak havoc but I tell you that Jesus is saying, I will stop the process long enough. I will come back so that life is not destroyed. So that those who love me do not all die. I've got to come to spare those who believe in me. So Jesus has a balancing act. He wants to hold off to give you time. But he doesn't want to stay so long that all people who believe in him lose their lives. And I want to call that and experience the power moment of a very different kind. Because that means that Jesus loves you enough. Listen, Jesus is coming, but he's not coming for revenge. Not against those who love him. He's coming, but it's not something I need to warn you about. He's coming. But it's not to catch you in trouble. He's coming, but he says, look, I'm telling you, I, I'm not willing that any should perish. So I'm keeping the door open as long as I can, but I can't stay too long or else all of those who believe in me will have perished. Do you see the balancing act? Do you see how caring Jesus is? And there are some people who think that this same Jesus is detached and doesn't care oh let me tell you the way you can know that he cares is to walk with him now there are some people who have never been poor i posit that you are culturally deprived poverty is not a wonderful thing in and of itself but poverty allows you to know jesus like wealthy people may never know him because until you get down to your last dime until you get to the end of your rope 
until you're between the devil and the deep blue sea. Yes, sir, that's it. Well, where I came from, they used to say, uh, until you're between a rock and a hard place. Until you have a challenge that you cannot answer, yes, sir. you don't really know who God is. Right. Until you have called everybody you know. Yes, until you called your aunt, your uncle, your cousin, until you've called the credit union, until you've checked with the bank, yes. until you've checked with every resource you know, and they all say, we can't help you. Yes. I love the way the bank tells you they can't help you. Yeah. Uh, you go down there and try to make a loan, and here's what they'll tell you. Sir, I'm sorry, but uh, the bank is unable to help you at this time. Now, I'm sitting there looking in the vault. <laughs> I see enough money in there to really help me. <laughs> and this guy in a cute suit is telling me, at this time, the bank is unable to help you. What he means is he's unwilling to help me. <laughs> One day I got a little disturbed with a man who turned my loan application down. I told him, all that money in that vault belongs to my father. Oh, he thought I was crazy, but I felt really good saying it to him. I said, the Lord owns the silver and the gold, the cattle on a thousand hills. And he probably went home that night and said, a crazy preacher came down here and applied for money. But one day, he'll discover I was telling the truth. <laughs> so all I'm saying is that you must understand the power of Jesus to evaluate how to save me. I got to wait a little longer for Walter. But I can't wait too long so that trouble beats him down and he loses his life. So somewhere between the moment that he should surrender and the moment that he'll be wiped away, I got to open that door real wide for him and say, come on, son. Come on. I don't know about you, but I can hear him sometimes. I hear him beckoning to me. Come on. Your time is running out. And it is because he has that ability that he can do the things I'm about to describe now. I need to take you to Matthew chapter 24. If you didn't turn, you're in great shape. Matthew chapter 24, and look at verse 30. Because we're getting ready to get to a sequence now that will show you what God is about to do. Jesus is about to set things straight. Now, if you think you're outside, that makes you nervous. But if you know that he's invited you to be a part of the family, you ought to be really excited about that. Right. If you're in with the family, then you are happy that he's going to set it straight. Matthew chapter 24, and look at verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The sign of Jesus coming will be clouds remember the bible says that as those disciples watched jesus lifted up from them remember that messenger came and said why stand ye gazing this same jesus if i had time tonight to preach on this same jesus not another jesus this same jesus will so come as you have seen him go if he went up in clouds He'll come back in clouds. The Bible says that at the end of time, there will be false Christs. There'll be people who claim to be the Messiah. I have seen a few already. I've lived long enough to see them. But none of them has come in clouds. That's pretty hard to stage. Huh? That's not a Spielberg moment. You can do it on film, but you can't make that happen. No, no power that's supernormal can make clouds deliver somebody. And when you see Jesus coming, one of the signs will be that he'll come back just like he went away. He will come back in the clouds. There is nobody who's been able to mimic that yet, and I don't believe they ever will. It's one of the things that identifies him. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 says the same thing. There will be clouds. He will come and every eye shall see him. So if they say, hey, Jesus came. <laughs> no. Yes, but he did. 
No, he didn't. Well, I hear you turning. I'm glad you are. You ought to look at it. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. The Bible says that you won't have to ask, did he come? You won't have to hear it on television. You won't have to read it in the newspaper. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. He comes with the sign of clouds. Now, when Jesus comes, there are going to be some things that are going to happen. First Thessalonians, I didn't want to read this one, but I love this text, so I read it every opportunity I get. First Thessalonians chapter 4. When you get there, you'll understand why I like it. First Thessalonians chapter 4. I'll start with verse 16. Anytime I get an excuse, I read this because I like it. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Do you see it? You know there are clouds. It says he shall descend from heaven with a shout. Can I stop there just for a minute? I understand cultural differences. I really do. My wife and I have been blessed to travel to 60 countries in the island nations of the sea. I've been to places where they say, when we are in religious services, we are very quiet. And it's okay. I told you my rule. But when I see them in other places, these same people, they get excited about games and sports. I even see some of the people reading a book and a little tear traces its way down their face. They watch movies and, and weep. But they say we're not emotional. And I'm okay with that. You do any way you want to. But let me tell you something. The Bible says that when Jesus comes, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Now I hope that doesn't offend you. But the Bible says that's what's going to happen. So for everybody who is unable to appreciate a shout, oh, that's going to be a terrible experience for you. But I tell you what, I'm going to be caught up in it. It's going to be an experience, the power moment for me. With a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Oh, I got to read, but I want to stop. Then, then, listen, listen. Then we which are alive and remain. Huh? So according to the Bible, when Jesus comes, somebody is going to be alive. It says, then we, when we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so... Shall we ever be with the Lord? I had a wonderful discussion with a man one day and he said to me, Pastor, I'm not sure I will enjoy heaven. Well, I had to think about that for a minute. How could you not enjoy heaven? But he said, I think it's going to be boring. I said, okay, explain. He said, well, what are you going to do? He said, I've tried to read in the Bible. I can't find anything in there that interests me. I took him to this text. I said, the Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. When I'm with Jesus, I don't have to have anything to do. Jesus is my life. In him I live and move and have my being. I've got 10,000 questions I want to ask him. I've got things that I want him to explain to me. I want him to tell me about how he created Adam and then Eve. I've got so many things. If he didn't have time, he might send me away. But just to be with him is excitement for me. Just to behold his face. There have been times on this earth when I have been praying and I thought maybe, maybe I could see him. But the Bible says we, we don't know all the things that will happen then. But this one thing we know, when, we, when he appears, we shall be like him. So I guess one thing that's going to excite me is that I'm going to look at him and look at me and say, Hey, I look like you. That'll keep me for about 10 years. 
just the recognition that having had a relationship with Jesus for all these years on earth, by beholding him, I have become changed into his likeness. Not by beholding his natural face, but by looking at him on the pages of his holy word. I can see him from time to time. Can you? Oh, I don't have to have it come up and turn into a video screen. I don't have to have all that technology. All I need is to read the words of what he did. I can shut my eyes and see it. I know, in fact, when I finally got to the Holy Land, I walked in some places and knew where they were. I knew what it was. I asked the guide. I said, hey, I know what this is. Have you been here before? Well, not exactly. <laughs> but I've been in here. Amen. <laughs> so, so for me, it's no problem. All I need to know is that for the rest of my life, I'm going to be where Jesus is. One of my favorite writers says there will come a moment after we've made it home. When the first Adam, you know what I'm talking about. When the first Adam and the second Adam, who is Jesus, will meet. I'm excited about that now. So that means that Adam is going to see Jesus. And they're going to start walking towards each other. Come on. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, I've read it and I believe that the, the second Adam may be walking. But I believe that Adam, who knows what Jesus did for him, won't be able to walk. I think he's going to run and throw his arms around Jesus because without Jesus Adam wouldn't be able to live on and then guess what he better form a line because I'm gonna get in there somewhere and get me a hug amen what in the world is it gonna be like well you're a slow crowd you're not ready for this let me give you another text <laughs> this is second Thessalonians so if you are wise and didn't do what I did you are close to second Thessalonians now I'm supposed to be factual I get a little excited so forgive me would you uh, the Bible excites me forgive me if maybe I got the right job what do you think <laughs> what you must know is that when Jesus comes all of the righteous the righteous living you read what's gonna happen with, with those folk right they'll be caught up to meet Jesus in the air but the Bible says that the righteous dead shall come up first and they will go up together with those who are alive. Isn't that going to be something? You're going to see somebody who died in Christ and you thought you might never see him again? You think you might meet some relative in that group? Somebody who died in the faith? But now they are called from their grave. And, and when they come up, they're going to see people who they know who's still alive. And all of us will be caught up together to meet with the Lord in there. So all the righteous people are going to be gone to heaven with Jesus. Do you feel any power in that? Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And verse 8 says this. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. You remember what, uh, what the Lord told Moses in the mount? Moses said, let me see you. The Lord said, no, nobody has seen me and lived. The, the wickedness of man cannot behold the righteousness of God without some veil without some separation so the Lord says let me hide you over in that hole in the rock pass by you and you can look at my back because that's all you can take the Bible says that after the righteous dead are called forth and the righteous living join together and we are all caught up 
together in the clouds. Now I've got acrophobia. Do you know what that means? That means that I don't like heights. So I'm going to have to whisper to my angel, do you know about me? <laughs> and I know what he's going to say. I know. You don't like heights. But uh, in a moment, remember you felt that just now? You remember that twinkling of an eye? Do you still feel frightened? No, I don't. Look down. Man, I didn't know we were this high. And you, you don't have that phobia anymore. That's gone. But the righteous are gone. And the Bible says that the wicked shall be consumed with the brightness of his coming, with the spirit from his mouth. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 4 says the breath of his lips shall slay him. The breath of his lips. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. You need to read this. Hebrews chapter 10. You've got to know that when Jesus comes, there won't be much division for somebody to slip through the cracks. There'll be only two categories. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. And let's make sure we get verse 26. And here's what it says. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. I know why you're quiet. After you know the truth, if you sin willfully. Watch this, verse 27. But a certain fearful looking for, looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now listen, the Lord's trying to talk to you. He's not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want you in this group. But if after you know what's right, you willfully go the wrong way. The Lord says the only thing's left for you, there is no mercy for you because you willfully kept on in your path and the only thing you can do now is look forward to a fiery end but trust me nobody is going to be able to say see Jesus wasn't fair in fact you know something I'll tell you what I believe this is not in the Bible so please don't credit it or debit it to the Bible I believe one of the worst things about missing heaven is going to be that you can't blame it on anybody. Right. You know, if you're in trouble, don't you like to blame it on somebody? It was my husband. Horrible man. Reason why I missed him. You're not going to be able to blame it on him. Because Jesus can save you sleeping right next to your husband. All right. Do I need to make that clear? Yeah. Jesus isn't going to save people by beds. He's not going to save people by houses. Not even going to save people by churches. I'm trying to be clear. So if your name is on the church roll, on that pretty church with the marble pulpit, and you think that, well, if my name is there. Surely, when he cometh, and the clerk brings out the records, I'm certain that everyone in our church shall be saved. Well, you better think again. Even your pastor going to have to be with Jesus. Or the pastor's not going to make it. Even the people whose names are on the cornerstone won't be able to make it unless they've got a relationship with Jesus. If they don't, they are looking forward to a fiery future when God destroys the adversaries. If you see it, can I hear you say amen? Well, watch this. So you've got nobody. Now, if, if all the righteous people are in heaven and all the wicked people have been destroyed by the brightness of his coming, yeah. who's left? Well. Come on, this is not a trick question. Who's left? Yeah. Ah, somebody's too smart. <laughs> uh, Revelation chapter 20, that's where you've already started thinking towards. Revelation chapter 20. I'm just going to read the Bible for a while and try not to interrupt. You will forgive me, I hope, if I have to, but... I'm going to just try to read the Bible. 
Revelation chapter 20. I need to get in good light. And here it is. I'm starting with verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit yes, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season and I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast neither his image neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such the second death hath no power but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years and when the thousand years are expired Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sands of the sea and they went up on the breath of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them verse 12 and I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were open and another book was opened, and which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now that's a lot of Bible reading. But you understand it, don't you? There is a theory in theology. Well, it's way more than a theory. Called the millennium. There are some people who are post-millennialist and pre-millennialist. I happen to be what the Bible says I'm not gonna get into a category I'm just gonna do what Jesus said Jesus says at the end of time there'll be a moment when all the righteous go to heaven all the wicked are destroyed and the righteous will be in heaven with Jesus for a thousand years but when you're gonna live forever a thousand years is nothing to get excited about and the Bible says that the righteous reigned with him and judged with him and on earth there's nobody left but the devil in fact when the Bible says in the symbolic language of Revelation that the devil is bound with a chain yes. and they threw him into the bottomless pit yes. and and he could trouble the nations no more all it means is that there's nothing to do right. Right. what does the devil do is there anybody in here knows what the devil does isn't he always talking to you about something you ought to do? Doesn't he either come personally or send one of his representatives to tell you something that you ought to do and you can get away with it? Haven't you discovered that when he sends you to do something, he will let you get in the middle of it? Then he will send your whole church membership by. <laughs> to catch you in the middle of it. That's what he does. He, he calls on your weakness. He calls on... On, on foibles he calls on your greed he'll always have you in something that's what the devil does but when all the righteous folks are in heaven and all the wicked people are dead the devil is going to be in one of the greatest open cemeteries that the universe has ever known I guess if he ever thought he had creating power or resurrecting power he'd go and say get up doesn't have it 
So for a thousand years, the devil's going to be in an open morgue. Yes. Is he going to be mad when that thousand years is over? And the Bible says for just a, a little while, at the end of that thousand years, then those who are wicked will be animated. And the devil, knowing all that he knows, will say, come on, let's go take the city. Well, let's find the city. You ready to find the city? Yeah. Revelation chapter 21. Let's find the city. I wish I could talk about it, but I don't have time. Yeah. Revelation chapter 21. And look at what the Bible says. Start with verse 1. And I saw a new heaven yeah. and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, I'm going to say it fast, but I have done thousands of weddings. I have seen brides who didn't look like much before the wedding. But when they are adorned for their husband, coming down the aisle, I've never seen an ugly bride. John says, I saw New Jerusalem looking like a bride at a wedding. Well, you said it. It says there, in black, let's look at verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. So we are going to see the city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. It will come to earth. It will be the earth made new. Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 17. Isaiah chapter 66, verses 22 and 23. God will bring that city back to earth because the greatest urban renewal project that the universe has ever known is about to ensue and God will make the earth over again because he's about to deliver it to Jesus and those who have dominion with Christ and the earth that we receive is not going to be the one you're looking at tonight it's going to be made over again so in fact you need to know who's going to live in that city called the new jerusalem revelation chapter 22 and verse 14 don't argue with this text it's really clear blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city so if you want to live in that city the bible says you got to keep the commandments i've already found out I can't do it, but I testify with Paul tonight. He says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I'm still alive, but it's not me living. I have let Jesus come inside me, and the life I live now is Jesus running me from the inside, running me from inside my head. Do you see it tonight? Would you praise God with me? Now, here's... Here's the text I want to leave with you, and you may not find it. Please write it down. The book is Nahum. Nahum. N-A-H-U-M. Go to Malachi and turn back very slowly. And if you are blessed, you might find it. Nahum chapter 1 and verse 9. What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. I'm going to try to say this with civility. It's hard. Because what the Lord said is this. I'm going to hold the door open for you. As long as I can. I'm not slack concerning my promise. But I'm also long suffering. So inside of me there's a a balancing going on I got to come back because if I don't come back all flesh will be dead but I don't want to come back preemptively because somebody who could make it in might not get in so I'm gonna balance it as only God can I'm gonna hold it open just long enough for the last to get in 
but I've got to come back in time so that Satan doesn't destroy all those who believe in me and I tell you that tonight you and I are in that moment we're in that moment when Jesus knows that it's almost time to come back but he doesn't want to close you out in fact I believe with all my heart that somebody looking at me preaching right now has a personal opportunity to come to Jesus and he says whatever it takes I will do it I'm not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance and so I believe that Jesus is holding the door open but he's got to come back so tonight he assures you once I conquer sin once the devil has brought those people who have forgotten who I am to try to take heaven I'm gonna rain down fire and brimstone the earth will melt with fervent heat I will burn it until it's brand new and sin will not come back but before I take sin out I want to bring you in and I know Jesus well enough having read what his invitations are to know that somebody has an invitation tonight that's personal they're gonna pass out at your downlink site some commitment card somebody needs to say tonight I wanna be in that number now until tomorrow night may God hear you when you call may God lift you if you fall may God bless you as you stand may God hold you in the palm of his hand good night Walter Pearson believes that Jesus Christ is the answer to every problem you face.